Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Linnea Baldwin, who is a professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology in the Division of Laboratory Genetics and Genomics at Mayo Clinic. Linnea, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, and I'm very excited to have a conversation with you about the impact of genetic testing on cardiovascular disease, since I know this is an area you work in. So I'm very curious if you can explain what is the value of genetic testing in the setting of cardiovascular disease? So cardiovascular disease has a um, large hereditary component to it. Um, there's a lot of cardiovascular disorders that are monogenic or have um, multiple different genes that underlie their cause. And so you can think of different types of, of these hereditary cardiovascular disorders like cardiomyopathies or arrhythmias. Um, you can think of aortopathies like Marfan syndrome, um, and you can think of the dyslipidemias. So, for example, familial hypercholesterolemia, um, which is characterized by high LDL levels, is one of the most common genetic diseases worldwide. And the value of testing is that um, a lot of these are not diagnosed specifically by phenotype. So the patient goes in, they look like they have something going on, and there's clinical criteria for a lot of these different disorders, um, but they may, for example, meet the clinical criteria for one disorder but actually have another disorder by genetic testing or um, the other way around where they don't actually meet the threshold for the clinical criteria, so it's unknown what they have. So with next-generation sequencing, what we do now is we do these large gene panels where you can basically test for, um, you know, 50 to 100 genes that are associated with different disorders and really narrow down what the gene is that's involved. And that's very helpful from, a, a, a diagnostic standpoint. And then, B, you can do genetic testing on family members who are at risk for potentially having that same disorder, and you can rule in and rule out um, which family members have that disorder. And then you can do, um, in a lot of cases, you can do management of the patient based on, you know, what they have just in a general standpoint, like a cardiomyopathy, or what they have from a gene standpoint. So you can do, like for the, for the example with aortopathies, depending on the gene involved, you might have differences in um, the timing of when you would do aortic imaging, um, the frequency, the location, and then um, there's differences with the genes in terms of how aggressive, for example, aortic aneurysm progresses. So when you would do prolactic, uh, prophylactic aortic root surgery depends on the, the gene and the diameter of the aorta. So there's a lot of different ways that the genetic testing can inform us, um, both for diagnosis, family testing, and patient management. It sounds like the benefits are immense in terms of being able to characterize some of these patients by genetic testing and help their family members as well. What are some of the challenges associated with this type of testing? So there are quite a few challenges. I mean, even though the technology has just grown so much over the years, you know, we've gone from struggling to do a single gene to now doing hundreds of genes. But the issue with doing hundreds of genes or even exome where you're doing thousands of genes is that you get so much data back. And then what do you do with the data? So we end up um, spending a lot of our time, and the, the most amount of time that we spend is on variant interpretation. So we get all these genetic variants back. And you know, the more you do, the more you understand, the more you know that these variants are benign or these variants are, are pathogenic. It's, it's actually rarer to have a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant and more common to have variants of uncertain significance. And the variants of uncertain significance aren't very helpful. <laughs> so I've heard, I heard somebody say that a variant of uncertain significance has a 10 to 90% chance of being pathogenic. So, okay, that means, you know, that's not helpful at all. So, <laughs> so we have, you know, the variants of uncertain significance, and then we also have genes of uncertain significance where, especially with something like exome sequencing, where 
genes will pop up, and it looks like the type of variant that they have is is potentially pathogenic, but we don't know what the gene means or what it does. And there's a lot of cases like that. So then that's not very helpful either. So that's, you know, probably the biggest challenge. If a sample is sent to multiple labs, are you getting different results based on the experience of that lab handling that sample? That's that's a really good question. And it's actually something that we encounter quite frequently. Um, so different laboratories, like you said, have different experiences and different knowledge about their areas of expertise. And so some laboratories or some laboratory directors or genetic counselors might not be as well versed in, for example, certain genes or certain variant types, and they might not realize that this certain variant that they've detected is likely pathogenic, and they might call it a variant of uncertain significance. And in fact, we've seen that where we, we've seen it multiple times where a variant has been called like that, a VUS, um, and even has gone so far to say as this variant is not predicted to be associated with the phenotype of the patient, when actually that variant is likely pathogenic. And it's, it's important that we call it that because what happens is if you undercall a variant, um, the patient will end up search, continuing to search for answers because that VUS is not helpful. And so they'll get additional testing, and the, they won't know their diagnosis, and they'll say, I just don't have an answer. Um, and then on the other side, if a variant's overcalled, which we also see, so we'll see something called a likely pathogenic when it should really be a VUS or maybe even likely benign where it wouldn't even show up on the report. If it's called likely pathogenic, then it's a false positive. And let's say family members get tested. And they say, oh, I don't have this likely pathogenic variant. I'm not at risk for developing colon cancer or whatever the case might be for whatever test that they're doing. And that's a big danger. So there's differences in um, laboratory variant interpretation. There's also differences in the technology used and the genes tested. So um, I think it's, it's, hard, it's a little bit challenging to be able to convey to the, the ordering clinicians that this test has more genes or more relevant genes compared to this test offered by this laboratory. But there definitely are differences, and there's also differences in the type of variants that some laboratories are able to, to detect. So one laboratory might have a much more comprehensive test compared to another, but they're on the surface they look the same. Is there any collaboration that is ongoing between laboratories to help resolve these variants of undetermined significance? Yeah, there. so what's been really helpful in the past, I don't know, 10 years or so is the development of um, a group called ClinGen, um, and they are funded by the NIH, so there's a publicly um, funded group, and there's a publicly funded database through ClinGen called ClinVar. And it's a very helpful resource. Laboratories um, are invited to basically deposit their variant interpretation information. And you can also add why you called it that way. So some laboratories just say, we called it this. We called it likely pathogenic, but with no reasoning for it. And other laboratories provide the reasoning, and that's super helpful. So it's good to go in and see. We always check that to see what if it's in, you know, sometimes there's no, um, these variants are rare, so sometimes there's no information in there on the variant, but a lot of times there is, and it's really helpful to see what other laboratories call these. And is there ongoing research, aside from the clinical labs, comparing results and, and looking at these variants uh, to determine their significance, is there ongoing research, and who does this type of research to determine the value of these? Yeah, so I guess the other thing that I would mention is is related to this ClinVar database. There's um, within ClinGen itself. There's different um, expert groups, and they're international. So they might be related to a specific gene. So we have one um, international group for FBN1, the gene involved in Marfan syndrome, and we develop guidelines for how to interpret variants in FBN1 because each gene is so specific. You can't just have variant interpretation guidelines that are generic to all genes. It's, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, and then there's also um, expert groups that look at different disease states and say which genes are relevant to be tested and which genes are disputed as being relevant and those types of things. So those are very helpful. And then 
from the standpoint of your question about um, what uh, what we can do when we see a variant of uncertain significance, how we can resolve it, that's a little bit harder. So you can do um, potentially do familial studies, and you can see is this variant tracking with disease in the family or not. But you you have to test a lot of people in order to get a solid answer on that. So that that's not always the the greatest approach, but it can it can be helpful. And the other thing is you can do RNA studies. Um, so sometimes we'll see a variant, and it will be what we call a silent variant. And so it's not changing an amino acid. It's not causing a truncation or anything like that that we know of. It's just one um, nucleotide change for another. But it could be having some sort of misplacing effect in the gene, but we just don't know. But if you do RNA studies, um, you, can, you can see if that's the case or not. Now, those types of studies are more expensive to do, and um, it's a little bit tricky to know um, basically how to get reimbursed for that type of additional testing. And a lot of laboratories don't do that because of that. It's just, it's a lot of extra work and it's hard to figure out how to basically charge for it. Yeah, the process sounds very labor intensive from the even interpretation piece. So I'm curious, kind of where are we in terms of cost for this? People keep talking about, you know, the dropping price of genetic testing. You know, are we close to being under 100? What, you know, where are we? Yeah. Well, I remember for a while it was the thousand dollar genome, and then it went under that, and you know, supposedly. So I think, from a research standpoint, um, you can do genetic testing uh, fairly cheaply. But when you're talking about a clinical lab, it's just astronomically more expensive. So part of it is just the nature of the regulatory environment and needing to, you know, validate these tests to a very high standard, which of course you want for patient care. And the other part of it is all the personnel involved. Um, so, you know, we can do a variant interpretation for one variant and it might take us 12 hours and five different people looking at it. And, you know, that's that adds up to be quite a lot more than what we actually charge for the test. The equipment itself is very expensive. These sequencers are, you know, million dollars at least. Um, and then the reagents, clinical grade reagents. I mean, you know, all the things you talk about from a, a clinical laboratory. So that really, um, you know, increases the price of these tests. And, you know, from a, a genome, a whole genome or a whole exome, those are tens of thousands of dollars to run. So they are, they are very expensive. And in that setting, it sounds like the demand is obviously there because it's one of the grow, big, like largest growing areas in laboratory medicine. So I'm curious, though, where are we in terms of access? Do pa our patients be affording these ten thousand dollars? Because you know, in, in some settings, is it the insurance who's paying for it? Is it the patient who's paying for it? So where are we in terms of access, and who's paying these large bills? Yeah, I, and I think that that can be an issue as well. So certain types of genetic tests are pretty well reimbursed. I know, for example, rapid genome sequencing in, um, in, in critically ill newborns, that's generally well reimbursed, which is great. That, that's been a, really a wonderful test that's been super helpful in, in helping to diagnose and understand what's going on, again, with these critically ill newborns. So, but otherwise, it's a little bit variable about if um, reimbursement is going to happen or not, if the insurance company will cover it. So unfortunately, sometimes the patients do pay out of pocket for these tests. So knowing this about already how difficult it is to access some of these tests, what do you think the impact of the FDA's final rule on laboratory developed tests, which largely impact molecular testing like these, what kind of impact will that have on access? Yeah, I think that that's a really good question. And, and it's something that's concerning because, like you said, these tests are already very expensive. And I think with increased regulation, um, many laboratories are probably not going to be able to afford to to do all the the uh, reg uh, to do all the validation that's required by regulatory agencies, including the FDA. So I'm anticipating that, laboratories will drop out of offering this test, so fewer laboratories will be able to offer, and the tests will 
cost even more. And so the concern, obviously the concern with that then is less um, availability or less accessibility of the testing to more people. So that's, that's a problem. And then I think the other piece of it is, you know, we talked about how we have like the ClinVar database and we have these communities of laboratories that are working together to try to figure, you know, figure these tests out and figure out genes and variants and everything. And the fewer laboratories that are doing the testing then will, I think, be a setback in terms of having these collaborations. So it is a concern both for accessibility and, and even probably the advancement of the practice of, of medicine, of genetic testing. And looking further into the future, I know we've basically looked at what the FDA's impact will be on this, but scientifically, technically, clinically, what are some developments in this space that are exciting uh, for you projecting in the next five to 10 years? Where do you see us going? So I think that there's a lot of exciting things going on. You know, we talked about the advances in technology and going from single gene testing to now multi uh, exomes and genomes and things like that. And there's um, a lot of improvements in the speed in which we can do testing. We have rapid genome sequencing, ultra rapid genome sequencing, and just being able to provide answers in that critical care setting more rapidly is is hugely beneficial. But there's a lot that we don't understand about the genome. Um, there's, you know, a lot of times we'll encounter a variant and in, we know it's likely pathogenic, but in some individuals, disease will be expressed and in others it won't. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is notorious for that. Even within the same family, they'll have the same genetic makeup, but some people will get, get it and some people won't. And we don't understand why. So what's modifying that variant? Why is it expressing here and not there? So there's a lot we don't understand about the genome um, that if we can um, learn more through just understanding modifiers and, and things like that. And, I, and we're, coming, we're coming along in that area. And then I think the other thing is the more testing we do and the more we're able to build up these databases of um, matching the patient phenotype with the specific genetic variant, we can start to... Um, develop better ways to, to manage the patient based on their, their genotype or their gene involved. And then we can also develop novel therapies. So if you look at, um, for example, familial hypercholesterolemia and the way that a bright, um, in the past like 10 years, therapies towards um, PCSK9 have been developed. And this was all based on finding PCSK, um, elevated PCSK9 in patients with um, high, high cholesterol. And then Helen Hobbs went and found low levels of PCSK9 in patients with very low LDL, like 14 milligrams mm -hmm. per deciliter. And so the pharmaceutical companies picked up on this and they said, oh, so if we knock out PCSK9, you're going to have low LDL and you're going to have protective cardiovascular effects. So, and anti-PCSK9 therapies have been very successful. And there's a lot of other examples like that. So it's really exciting to see how these genetic tests can, you know, eventually inform novel therapies. So I'm glad you brought up speed of testing, because that's one issue that we all know, like genetic testing can take usually like four to six weeks, sometimes longer. So you're, you imagine that in the next five, 10 years, like how quickly would you be able to get those results for such critical cases that you need an answer for? Yeah, well, there's, you know, for the ultra rapid genome sequencing, those can be in less than 24 hours. And n normal rapid genome sequencing is usually five to seven days for a preliminary report. So I think the the easy part is we can do the testing really fast, or, or some labs can if they have, if they have the money uh, and the equipment. But um, we're, we still run into the issue of variant interpretation. And that does take the longest part of the test. And that's why if you have a standard genome s sequencing test, so not a rapid genome, just a standard, that's like six to eight weeks is because you're trying to match up this complex phenotype with this all this genetic information. You're looking at family members and how their testing went and you're filtering variants. And that just takes a really long time. So, but I think as we continue to collaborate, um, and understand what these genes and variants mean, it'll just, it will get faster. 
Dr. Linnea Baldwin, thank you for sharing your perspectives with us. And everyone, thank you for watching. Thank you.